Now, more than 30 million people in the UK have now had at least one dose of the COVID vaccine, as the health secretary hailed a phenomenal achievement. And the first supplies of the Moderna vaccine are due to arrive here next month. The latest 24-hour government figures show a further 19 people are reported to have died with COVID, bringing the UK total to 126,500. There have been another 3,800 new cases in the UK and another 420,000 people received their first dose of a COVID vaccine yesterday. More than 30 million people have now received that first dose of a vaccine. But in Europe, around 20,000 people a week are still dying with COVID and rates in Central Europe are now amongst the highest in the entire world. Yet vaccination efforts have been woefully slow to get off the ground. has now celebrated his second Palm Sunday in an empty basilica in a city in renewed lockdown. In the eternal city, restricted freedoms are beginning to feel eternal, as Italy, like so many other countries in Europe, is trying to rein in a third wave of COVID-19. But the Pope was less concerned about the virus itself and more about the dark forces it has unleashed. We are taking stock of the evil which is defining our reality, the physical, the psychological, and above all, the spiritual evil, because the devil is benefiting from this crisis by sowing distrust, desperation, and discord. Divine intervention will not save planet Earth from this plague, but vaccines will, if only they could be acquired and injected in sufficient numbers. And that's the story everywhere outside a lucky few countries. In France, they may be winning the race on two wheels, but they've been losing the one involving jabs and arms. Here they've only vaccinated just over 11% of the population, compared to the UK's 43%. President Macron is telling France that it can catch up with Britain in a few weeks. Speed is of the essence, especially when ICU wards in Paris are filling up, and France reported losing almost 900 people to the virus just on Friday. The picture in Hungary is even more bleak. The country went from one of the best in class of 2020 to the worst per capita death rate on the entire planet. In Germany too, the government has gone from COVID hero to zero, coming under pressure from the virus and from arrested public, facing a third extension to the latest strict lockdown. This graph shows the extraordinary reversal of fortunes between the UK and the rest of Europe between January and now. Vaccines make all the difference. And even if the EU manages to get its hands on the 200 million doses it was promised by May, it'll be too late to prevent the current third wave. Not for the first time in its history, it was left to Barcelona to show Europe how tantalizing the future, albeit a rather weird one, can look. A concert of 5,000 people, all tested on the way in, all to be tested a few days after the music has stopped ringing in their ears, and all masked lab rats in a giant experiment to see if what we used to call fun is possible in the time of COVID. Well, there's been a lot of talk recently of vaccine nationalism or vaccine protectionism between the EU and the UK, a period which also happened to coincide with the beginnings of a fully-fledged Brexit. Well, earlier I spoke to Professor Anand Menon, the director of the UK in a changing Europe, and I began by asking him if Brexit is at all to blame for tensions between the UK and the EU over vaccine supplies. I don't think the substance has anything to do with Brexit. I think it's frankly wrong to claim that we have got to where we are because we'd left the European Union. But I think Brexit matters in the sense that, on the one hand, our government was very, very keen to crow about its successes and put them in the context of Brexit. And I think there's very little doubt that, on the other hand, this got under the skin of Ursula von der Leyen in particular and has made the Commission just act a little bit crossly and therefore without thinking things through particularly well. And she, of course, is under enormous pressure herself, not least from Germany. And they're basically blaming her for having messed this up. Absolutely. The European Commission's in a very difficult position. Uh, I mean, we can talk about whether they made mistakes. I think they probably did make some mistakes in their approach to vaccine purchases. But the fact of the matter is, 
having taken the decision to do this collectively via the European Commission, the Commission is in a very vulnerable position if it looks like the rollout doesn't go, go well. And what might go wrong in Germany and in France next year when they have a presidential election is that the people in government right now could potentially lose power because of the very scrappy, slow nature of this vaccine rollout. Yes, there's no doubt, looking at the polls in Germany, that the governing CDU are suffering as a result of this uh, vaccination uh, problem that the European Union is experiencing. And incumbents are in an uncomfortable position. And all the more uncomfortable if they look across the channel and see what can only be described as the tremendous relative success of the British rollout. The government of Boris Johnson seems to have adopted quite a careful tone when it comes to managing this crisis. Is that because of the international supply lines? In other words, if there's vaccine protectionism, everyone loses out. To an extent, I think it's that. I mean, remember, the European Union has given itself powers to impose export controls on countries such as the United Kingdom, should it want to. But I also think the government's in the lucky position that it doesn't need to say anything because the facts speak for themselves. And let's face it, when it comes to facts nowadays, COVID facts are front and centre and everyone knows we're doing relatively well compared to the European Union. But there was an implied threat as well, wasn't there, from the government, that if for some reason the European Union were to, you know, stop the export of Pfizer uh, vaccines to the UK for those, you know, famous necessary second doses, we could stop the export of certain components made in Yorkshire that go into making the Pfizer vaccine. Absolutely, and this is the issue with complex supply chains, and this is why some member states have been saying to the European Commission to impose these controls would be to shoot ourselves in the foot, because ultimately we all depend on each other to get these vaccines made produced and delivered. Could all this be over, this spat, in a couple of weeks or in a month, you know, month or two, you know, when Europe has been vaccinated to the degree to which they're now promising their people they will get vaccinated? Yeah, should the European rollout improve in terms of its speed, then yes, this will die down. It will also, I think, die down if the British government goes ahead and starts sharing vaccines with the people of the Republic of Ireland. But the other, the other thing that is worth talking about is, should the UK exit lockdown significantly earlier than other European countries because of our successful rollout, our economy is going to start functioning again a lot earlier than theirs. So there might be a second round of this in economic rather than public health terms, as Europeans turn to their governments and say, Look, the Brits are out and about shopping. We're still locked down because of your failures with the vaccine. You mentioned Ireland there. It's intriguing, isn't it? The British government reportedly has offered, you know, vaccine doses to the Republic of Ireland. Does it put the Irish in a bit of a quandary caught between Westminster and Brussels? I think there's no doubt it's a very smart move because it ticks the two crucial boxes. One, it's good PR and good diplomacy, but two, it helps us end the lockdown in Northern Ireland. So in that sense, from the UK government, this strikes me as a very, very sensible move. I think the Irish government will accept, to be perfectly honest, because if you're getting a supply of vaccines from a neighbour, you should probably say yes. Anna Menon, thank you very much indeed.